I will start with a song as it is customary for me to do always before I speak before a group of people. <laughs> Blessed be the name of the Most High God, the God whose I am and the God whom I serve. Blessed be his holy name forever. I exalt him, I lift him up, I praise him, I worship him, I honor him, I speak his truth and nothing else. I fear nothing but him for he is my strength and my shield. He is everything to me and everything that is. He holds the world together by the power of his hand. He's the Lord, he's the Lord of the universe. He's the Lord of Nigeria. He's the Lord of Africa. He's the Lord of each and every one of us. And I give him the glory today before anything else. Glory and honor and praise be unto him forever and ever. Amen and amen. amen. May I begin with the protocols. I first recognize the chairman of this great occasion. A great man. A man that has done so much. Not just for... Anambra, but for the entire country, Nigeria, and the man that we love and we remember with the greatest fondness, and somebody that was a good friend, a younger brother to my late father, and we love him very much, and that is Governor Jim Mwobodu. May I recognize the guest speaker of this occasion, the former president of Sierra Leone, a man that has spoken with such distinction and such a high level of intellectual quality today and I'm really impressed by what you've said sir we've learned so much from you and I'll say a few words about if I may about what you said today we welcome you sir may I recognize the governor of Anambra state ably represented by the deputy governor may I recognize the governor of Imo state ably represented by my good friend the former Minister of Education, Mrs. Viola Unwelleri, looking as beautiful as ever. May I recognize you, madam. May I recognize my big brother and the man that has been such a stabilizing force in my life. Every time I have any kind of small crisis or challenge, I go running to him. And he has never closed his doors to me. And you, you, you all know I've had many challenges in my life. <laughs> and he's a great man. And that's Senator Ben will be a doing a good. God bless you, sir. May I recognize my friend and brother, Governor Ohakim, who is here today with us. A good friend. I, I was with him, on the, if I may say so, I was with him on, the, on his last day in office um, when he was about to leave packing all his bags and he still found the time to see me and we had a long discussion about what was to come. And um, everything he said that day to me in the confines of his office and his home came to pass over the next eight years. So he's a man that is gifted with a, a very high level of the prophetic. And um, I commend you, sir. Thank you. May I also recognize somebody that's so important today, and that is the First Lady. First Lady at the beginning, First Lady at the end, First Lady always, the beautiful Mrs. Nambi Azikwe, whose husband and who is our father and her husband were coming to honor here today. May I recognize the Royal Fathers, the great Obi of Onisha, a good friend to the former Oni of Ife and the present one, a great friend to the people of the Anago, the sons and daughters of Ududua, a great friend to Nigeria, and a great traditional ruler, and the most paramount one in the whole of the Eastern Zone. I recognize you, sir. I recognize my father, the father of all of us, because I am now your son, sir, given the fact that I'm married to your, to your daughter, and that is the Azuzu of Oka, and all the other traditional rulers that are seated here today. May I recognize the Vice Chancellor of this great institution. And there are so many people, all his team, the directors, the bursar, and um, the professor of the, of, the, of the law faculty, who I can't see because I'm blocked by a beautiful lady. May I recognize that? May I recognize you, madam. And each and every one of you. Look, it's, it's a great honor and a privilege for me to be here today, to, be, to have been asked to come and say just a few words, and I'll try and be very brief. Um, and, you know, I'm touched to the marrow 
And when I first got the invitation, I was a little bit apprehensive that, that does my big brother really want me to come here? I may say some things that might be a little bit harsh and inflammatory, um, because that is my nature. I believe that it's important to speak truth uh, always and um, let God do the rest. Um, but he had the confidence in me, so I'll try and be as restrained as possible. <laughs> I'll never invite him anywhere again. <laughs> no, we're, we're, on safe, we're on safe territory, sir. I assure you. <laughs> and um, so, you know, it, it, it really is a humbling experience to be here. And let me, let me just start by saying that it is befitting, and it is a great thing, a good thing, that an institution like this has been named after such a great man. And, I, you know, I really do, I really do wonder sometimes because I'm sorry to say this, even the people of the Southeast themselves, I have to say this, do not fully appreciate up till now what they had in Zeke. You see, Zeke was a man that didn't just make his mark in the Southeast. He didn't just excel here. He didn't just use the platform of the Southeast and become the president of the country. It wasn't as simple as that. Zik's whole legacy started long before then. And it's a testimony, it's a testimony of the power of unity and love between people from different ethnic backgrounds. That's what he represents to me more than anything else. Zik would have been the first premier of the Western region. Because Zik was as much a Lagosian as he was anything else. Zik was a man that lived in Lagos, that grew up in Lagos, that was voted for in Lagos. <coughs> and when the great Herbert Macaulay and an Ago son, a son of Odudwa, I don't use the word Yoruba for a number of reasons, <laughs> but an Ago son, who passed on, he, he created, in my view, probably one of the greatest political parties that ever existed, and that was the NCNC. That's Herbert, uh, that's, um, Herbert Macaulay. And on his dying bed, on his dying bed, he handed over the flag of this great party to Zeke of Africa. And he said, you will leave from now on. And the man now, and, and Herbert Macaulay now died, and Zeke took up the baton. And what did he do? Zeke went to elections in the Southwest, regional elections, and he would have become the first premier of the Western region. I think it was just a question of carpet crossing, very complicated issue. I will not go into it here because it will create all kinds of problems for me back home if I say the wrong thing on this. <laughs> but the facts are clear. The facts are that more or less, I think it was 10 or 11 people from a party called the IPU, Battle People's Party, crossed party lines and voted with um, the action group. And that is how Zeke was edged out. And he now made, you know, made that famous phrase that I shall go back to the East from whence I came. And he went back to the East. And you see, it was a domino effect. Because when he went back to the East, the next thing that happened, a man in the East, by the name of, I believe it was Ayo Etan, I'm not sure. I can't believe that there are more historians here than I. Um, he was premier of the Eastern region at the time. But when Zik came back, he was literally brushed aside. And the people of the Southeast, and particularly the Igbo people, supported him for that position, and that's where it all started. He became premier of the Eastern region from whence he came. And I think that in itself was a bit of a tragedy for us. Because if it had been different, if we hadn't looked at it the way we did at the time that we looked at it, um, and I'm saying, I'm talking about those from my part of the country, perhaps things would have been very, very different today in terms of integration, understanding, and so on and so forth. So, this legacy was remarkable, remarkable. And I, and I have to say this, Ma, that, you know, when I met him, I think it was in 1991-92, uh, we were on campaign with the lady, Alaji Omaru uh, Shinkafi, his Choice 92 campaign team, and I was a special assistant. And the first thing he said to me when um, I was introduced was that, do you know that your grandfather taught me at school? I said, really? I was shocked. He said, yes. I said, sir, I didn't know this. He said, it's the truth. That when I was at school in Lagos, your grandfather was my teacher. And that is, uh, my grandfather's name was Victor Adidak he, he went on to Cambridge. He went on 
to become a, a, a criminal lawyer and then he became the third Nigerian appointed as a judge. In those days we had uh, English judges, but he was the third, na third Nigerian. So, but he taught at the school, I believe it was MBHS, I'm not sure. Method, that's right, MBHS. He taught him and he told me that your grandfather had a profound impact on me and I will never forget him. And I felt really touched by that. Somebody else told me later that when he came back from the United States after getting his degree, they did a big, the Igbo State Union did a big dinner party for him in Lagos. And they invited my grandfather to be chairman of the occasion and he gave a keynote address welcoming Zig back home. And that was, that is the level of attachment and commitment. And that is the level of understanding that my family from two generations back have with the great Zeke of Africa. Now, quite apart from that, and I'll be very brief, it went further. My father, who was in Action Group from 1953, and uh, he left Action Group in 58, 59, he went to join the NCNC. And Zeke graciously, in my view, offered him the most powerful position that the NCNC could offer anybody in the Southwest at the time. You have to understand that in those days, the Southwest was split down the middle. NCNC and Action Group. It wasn't a question of one side dominating the other. It was literally 50-50. And my dad was appointed as the leader of the opposition in the Western Region, Western House of Assembly, and he led the NCNC team, and he you know, stood against Action Group, who were on the other side of the parliamentary aisle. So he worked with Zeke. So my father worked with him as well, just as my grandfather knew him and mentored him and stood by him. And I'm very, very proud of that. And, and, and there is that element of attachment that I have. But quite apart from all that, quite apart from all that, look at what he did and look at an ideal that we all shared. Some still share it, but not all. But at point, one point, we all shared that ideal. A united Nigeria, where every individual, regardless of tribe, regardless of faith, stood as an equal where everybody could aspire to be anything, regardless of where you came from, what your faith was, even who your father was. If you have the education, if you have the understanding, the wisdom and the knowledge and the courage, you will be able to aspire in that old Nigeria. Yes, there were issues here and there, but generally speaking, that was the principle on which our founding fathers established this country, fought for independence, won it. There were issues that came to fore almost immediately. And you know, you're, you, you are more familiar with this history than even those of us from outside the East are because you suffered it. And I think it's very important that anybody or anything that happens in the past that has led to a high level of trauma amongst our citizens and our people, trauma on the part of those that were oppressed and murdered and subjected to genocide, and trauma on the part of those that did it, those of us that did it to them. Because trauma comes on both sides. This is something we cannot and we must not ignore as if it never happened. We had issues. And those issues started familiar what happened. Everybody knows what happened. I don't need to go into that. It's very, very upsetting to talk about it. But we can't brush it under the carpet. We had issues. And those issues ended up in July 29, 1966, 300 Igbo officers were slaughtered in one night, including an Igbo head of state. Yes, before then, January 15, 1966, there was an earlier coup. And about 20 prominent people were killed that night. Brutal, terrible, and acceptable, including pregnant women. I would never subscribe to that. My father was the only one. They came to our house. And the man that led them is still alive. He's from the East, and I've made contact with him, but they came to our house, they took my father out, beat my father up in front of me, I was six years old, and took him away. But by divine providence of the finger of God, my dad was saying, so the point I'm making is this, I have every reason to hold on to that and say, we can never forgive, and not only can we never forgive, we will never forget, and whatever happens to those that did this, they deserved it, which is the narrative that some people are pushing through. I reject that narrative, totally and completely, because it violates everything about us as human beings. What happened? The next thing that happened 
was the revenge tool. Like I said, 300 killed in one night at Igbo head of state, the Yoruba uh, military governor. And then came the pogroms in the north, between 30 to 100,000, closer to 100, I have to say, slaughtered in northern cities in the space of four, five, six months. And then, of course, the great Ujuku said, everybody come back home. They went back home, and as they were going on every, tra every train stop, they were slaughtered. Those the people were killing them. That is your history. That is the truth. And nobody should deny you the right to remember that. Both those that suffered it and those of us that inflicted it. And what happened? Train station to train station until they got home. And they drew the line and then from here is Biafra, no more slaughter, and the war started. Now, I won't, I won't go too much into the issues of the war because there were two sides and people have, uh, let, me, let me put it like this, uh, varying views of history. But I will tell you this much, no matter what the history is, no matter what the situation is, and I'm glad that our Chinese friends are here because they will have, a, if, if they can understand what I'm saying, and I'm sure they can, they have a lot to learn from this too. That three million innocent civilians, not one, not two, three, three million, including one million children, were slaughtered in that civil war, all from the east, slaughtered by us, the federal forces and the Godogodo forces from the north that went into towns after the federal forces left and raped women and slaughtered people. Three million. And we starved three million Igbo children to death, and one million Igbo children to death. And we attempted to justify it. Let me tell you this. There is no greater act of genocide on the African continent. This is the greatest black on black act of genocide on the African continent in the history of Africa. It is absolutely terrible. I really don't know why anybody should talk about that. That is absolutely reprehensible. And we have not apologized for it. We have not reconciled. We have not sought to appease God for what we did. And we really believe things will go well with our nation. It cannot. And that's where it starts. And what happened after that? After the Civil War, we said no victor, no vanquished. But what did you do? You gave them 20 pounds, that's all. You took all their property everywhere in the country, except in the Southwest. I have to say this because it's the truth. We must be bound by facts. Most parts of the Southwest did not do that. But everywhere else in the country, if you're evil, you had a house, they took your property in the name of abandoned property, and they refused to give it back to you. But what did this do? This did not stop the great evil people. And that's when I knew that they are very different. I really, I'm not, I'm not saying that because I'm here, but there's something different. I, we've had our differences before. We've had issues, we've had intellectual debates, all sorts between ourselves. But when it comes to fundamental issues, these are extraordinary people. What happened? They came back into Nigeria, still believing in an integrated Nigeria, still saying, that we should all stay together as one. They move back to the north. They move to the west. They move to the Niger Delta. They move everywhere. They excel. They prosper. They built up their businesses. They built new homes. Today, most homes, most house properties in Abuja are, are owned by Igbo. They came back and they were fully integrated. And some of the greatest sons of the east have excelled in governance, in business over the last how many years? 20, 30 years have done so well. You wouldn't know what they had been subjected to as a people. And we, as Nigerians, conveniently took advantage of that and said, well, since they don't feel it, we shouldn't talk about it. We should just move on. Stop teaching history in the schools because they didn't want you to know the truth. Move on. And we have to get back. Let me tell you the challenge with that. They say, if you do not learn from the lessons of history, it tends to repeat itself. Now, what are we seeing today? What are we seeing today? And I'm coming to the issue of migration very briefly, short details. So please, forgive me. <laughs> what are we seeing today? I mean, it's, it's unbelievable, really. It really is extraordinary. And I'm not speaking here as a politician. I'm speaking as somebody that considers himself a moderate historian and also somebody that is a human being. I mean, I have a level of humanity in me. And I cannot sit by and see what's happening in this country today and say, well, it's okay, maybe tomorrow, in the name of one Nigeria, 
we should just accept it and say nothing and take it. Now, the problem is that most people think that way. And therefore, the situation has gone from bad to worse. There is nothing that is happening today that I did not say would happen before the election in 2015. We were deeply involved with the Jonathan campaign, and I told them, if the president is elected into power, A, B, C, D, E would happen within a space of time. It would get from back to worse. It will come back in 2019, and it will continue. You see, what we're dealing with is not just politics or political parties. We are dealing with an ancient agenda. And that agenda is being forcefully established, forcefully implemented by various individuals who understand what the game is all about. They know what they're doing. We are the ones that don't know what they're doing to us. But let's look at the facts. Today in Nigeria, and I wonder how Zeke would have felt, today in Nigeria, just as they killed people, they killed Igbos, they killed non Igbos before the Civil War, how many of your youth in the Southwest, in the Southeast, have been killed? ICOB youths have been killed over the last three, four years. Are they not human beings? Are they not human beings? Morning, day, and night. I will not forget. You should not forget. Nobody should forget. As long as you do not carry arms, as long as you do not threaten the state, as long as you do not inflict violence or preach violence, I do not see why it is that you cannot express yourself or express your right of self or, or, or express your desire, desire for, for a referendum for self-determination. And why wouldn't they? Why wouldn't they? Now, it didn't stop there, not just IPOB use. You go to the Southwest today, in the name of migration, migration, conquest by migration, I call it, and I'll come to that in a minute. Our forests are flooded with Fulani herdsmen, both from Nigeria and outside Nigeria. Now that's a great one for migration for you. They're there. You go to the middle belt. Communities are slaughtered, morning, day, and night. Priests are killed. Churches are burnt. Middle belt people are roasted alive. Their wives raped. Their children hacked to pieces in front of them. Then they burn the community, burn their homes. Then they now take it over. After they've taken it over, they give them new names. Do you know that's what's happening? If you don't believe me, ask them in Plateau State. Ask them in Benue. Ask them in Taraba. Ask them in Alabama. Ask them everywhere through the Midwest. I live in the North. And I've lived there since 2003. And I've visited these places. Southern Kaduna. Southern Kaduna particularly is a name of Ruga in the name of this expansion of Islamic faith, in the name of trying to Islamize in the name of just capturing land, in the name of forced integration. Because you manage to get away, what do you do? You become brazen. You become totally brazen. And you say, I can do anything and get away with it. And what happened uh, in the last couple of years, particularly since this president came back? Let me tell you what happened. For the first time in our history, for the first time in our history, we have a situation whereby the executive, let's talk about the executive first, President, Hausa Fulani Muslim. Every single security agency in our country, we have 17, all of them, headed by northern Muslims, except for one, which is the Navy. And I'm talking about everything. Everything you can imagine. I've, I've done the list, it's out there. Every, it's never happened before in history. I don't think Zik would be too happy with that. Why? This is a multicultural, multi-religious, multi-racial country. I work with Obasanjo. If you, if you come and suggest such a thing to him, and you say we should put Yoruba people, he will, he will throw you out so fast. But this president doesn't see anything wrong with that. Every single security agency is headed by a northern Muslim, except for the Navy. Now, let's look at the ministries. We're still, well, let's look at the presidency itself. 90% of the people that work at the presidency today, 90%, are all northern Muslims. And the lingua franca there is Hausa. I worked there. In those days, it was a mix. Under Jonathan, it was a mix. Under Yarad it was a mix. In our history, it's always been a mix. But now it's very different. You need to speak Hausa to get through the corridors. I don't think Zik would have been too happy with that. A situation whereby they came back in 2019, and all the, uh, the, north, the Northwest, where the president comes from, has no less than 10 substantive ministers. 10. That is, that is senior ministers, uh, for want of a better word. Substantive, for want of a better word. Substantive ministers, we call them. They have 10 from the northwestern zone alone. 
and you go elsewhere. Southwest, where I come from, they have five. Elsewhere, southeast, south, south, uh, north, central, and northeast, guess how many they have? They have three each. Just three. Which means that the Northwest has three times the number of substantive ministers than anywhere else in the country except for the Southwest, who they have 50% more. Is that right? I don't think Zeke would have been too happy with that. Everything under the executive, everything. The only thing they left was the governor of Central Bank because he chose to do their bidding. Everything else is in the hands of these people. I don't think Zeke would have been too happy with that. That's the executive. If it had been the executive alone, we could say, okay, we have constitutional protections. Let's look at the legislature. Let's look at the legislature before going to the judiciary. In the legislature today, we have a northern Muslim heading um, the Senate. Then in the House of Reps, a good friend of mine from the Southwest, Femi Badabila, I've known him for 40 years. He is uh, from the Southwest, but he's a Muslim. Suddenly became a Muslim. He's a Muslim, okay? And you know what they did? They, they put four people around him. Good friend of mine, and I'm not saying to describe him here. I have immense affection and respect, as I do for all these people I mentioned. It's just that we disagree. I'm entitled to disagree with what they're doing. Now, what they've done is every principal, the four principal officers, in the in the in the house of reds are all northern muslims so he has been they have put a ring around him just in case he decides to misbehave <laughs> let's look at the judiciary the supreme court headed by a northern muslim the courts of appeal headed by a northern muslim the federal high court headed by a northern muslim up until about three four months ago now you have a northern christian there and uh, he appears to be doing quite well and, you know, he managed to keep his job. Let's hope he keeps his job. But that's the equation. Nothing for the South there. Everywhere you go, everything they say, they tell you pointedly that, listen, we're prepared to deal and have dealings with the Southwest. We can do that because part of the Southwest supports us. But we will never trust anybody from outside that place. That is the mantra. I've seen it, I won't go into details, I won't mention names. And I've been, this has been said to me point blank to my face. That we will never forget, we will never forget what they did on the night of January 15th, 1966, when they slaughtered our leaders in the middle of the night. And I put it to them that it wasn't just your leaders that were killed. Our leaders were also killed from the southwest, from the south south, every other part. People were killed. Even an Ibo army officer by the name of Lieutenant Colonel Ulebe was also killed. I said, so where does all this stop? But they say they will never forget. Well, that's okay. But I don't think Zip would have been too proud of that. I don't think that was his legacy. I don't think that was the legacy of our law or the legacy of the founding fathers. I know it was the legacy of Sadan of Sokoto because he said it about dealing the Quran in the Sahadan. You know? I know it was the legacy of Usman Danfobio when he said spread the Quran with a sword or, the, or with a sword but spread the, the Islamic faith with the sword of the Quran. I know it was the I know it was the policy of a man that I honestly believe was a great nationalist until I read some of the things he said before he became prime minister, Sir Tafawa Baliwa, when he said that they don't believe in the unity of this country. I know it was the legacy of South Africa when he said that the northern minorities must never be allowed to, uh, to have to, to co must always be made slaves and the southerners must never be allowed to have power. This is what they said. And now it's being implemented before our very eyes. Now, ordinarily, because it's very romantic for us to say integration is a beautiful thing. And it is. My wife comes from the southeast, I'm from the southwest. I do not discriminate on gender or on race. I think it's an intellectually defective thing for anybody to be a racist. I am not a racist. I may have differences with certain people, but I cannot be a racist. I'm just too well brought up. But what I'm against is oppression in any shape or form. Now, it gets worse. Look at the issue of migration. And let's come to it now. Um, the president said, spoke in his uh, speech about external migration and people leaving Africa and so on and so forth. Now, whatever the numbers are, are, it is tragic that in our country, Nigeria, because of the number of people that have been running out of this country to look for greener pastures elsewhere, particularly in Europe, the highest number of prostitutes, according to European survey, I'm not saying it, they said it, the highest number of prostitutes in Europe, continental Europe today, are Nigerian women. It's a tragedy. 
The highest number of people that go through that uh, Saharan uh, route, as, as, as uh, whatever you call them, people that are running away, um, human traffickers help them, the highest number of the people that have been caught in Libya and arrested and, and sold into slavery, sold into slavery, something that had never happened in previous years, they're Nigerians. And this is our experience, sir. Our people are going out of the country, running away from trauma, economic deprivation, slaughter, mass murder, ethnic cleansing, and so on and so forth. They're looking for greener pastures because nothing is working here and nothing has been working from the, for the last four or five years. That is the challenge that we have. Now, that is emigration, going out. Let's talk about internal migration. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the most serious challenge that we have. It is the most serious challenge that we have. And, and I want you to really think about this because this is the bitter truth I'm about to tell you. Ruga was not just about cattle. Ruga was about creeping into a community in the name of cattle herding and settling there. And then establishing yourself in that place. And then claiming land rights. And then mingling with the local people. And then eventually you say you want your own Seriki. Then you will say you want your own Emir. Then you will say you have a right to rule the place and so on and so forth. In, uh, uh, internal migration or even external migration should never be at the expense of ethnic nationalism. And I'll tell you this much. Globalism has its benefits. Full integration has its benefits. But Mr. President, sir, Mr. Chairman, I have to tell you that I am a nationalist. I am a nationalist. And I don't see, I don't believe it's a dirty word. I don't think there's anything wrong with me saying that I, for example, if I were from here, that I am an Igbo man before being a Nigerian. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I don't think there's anything wrong with me saying that I am an Anago before being a Nigerian. And I resent the fact that somehow I'm being told that I must only say that which is political correct. We are under, under siege today throughout this country. The South is under siege. The Middle Belt has already virtually been captured. And the agenda is to do what Saudana and all of them said they would do many, many years ago. And we're seeing it before our very eyes. Now, having said all that, I have to say this. There is still a possibility for us to make this work. But everybody has to first acknowledge what the challenges and the problems are. I am astounded that African leaders People from outside this country, the lead country, like for example, Ghana, for example, was my in-law, was married to my sister, Nana, who was a brilliant man, brilliant man, was in Oxford. And he will be coming here seeing President Buhari and not tell him the bitter truth about what's going on to our people in this country. And it goes on and on. Now, I'm coming, I'm ending this in a moment. Let me just say something that is very painful to us. Not too long ago, the daughter of the leader of Afeni Ferry, and of course Afeni Ferry is the heart of, of Anagola. It's the heart of Udugwa. Our elders, our leaders, it's an ephemeral concept. It's not something you elect anybody to do. These are our elders. This is the soul of the Southwest. We may not always agree, but these are men tried and tested over the years. Great men. Great men who have stood against tyranny. Many of them were killed. Many of them incarcerated. That's Afeni Ferry for you. And Afeni Ferre's leader, Baba Fasoroti, his daughter was slaughtered. His daughter was killed. Right in the streets of the Southwest by the usual suspects. And that is just one. Many are being slaughtered. I commend the efforts of the leaders of the Southeast. I commend the efforts of Ohaneze. I commend the efforts of the governors of the Southeast, particularly governors. I commend the efforts of all the leaders and elders of the Southwest, uh, of the Southeast, because you've been so restrained. You've been so calm. You've managed the situation in a very skillful way. Had it not been for your restraint, this country would have burnt out long ago. I urge you to continue to be restrained. But I will tell you this. There is a tide that is rising. Not just in the Southeast but also in the Southwest. It is also rising in the Middle Belt. It is an irresistible tide. The tide of nationalism. The tide of people saying that enough is enough. The tide of people saying that I have a right to live. 
I have a right to espouse my Christian values. I have a right to be who and what I am. I have a right to be a Southern and be proud of it. I have a right to be a Middle Belt and be proud of it. I have a right to be a Christian and be proud of it. I don't have to accept your worldview. I don't have to accept domination. I don't have to accept integration in the name of political correctness. If you come to my yard and you kill my people and you burn my home and you attempt to eradicate my faith, I do not have a duty to welcome you and pray for you and say I will accept that in the name of God. You don't have the right to tell me that. And I will acknowledge three sons of the East, nay, three sons of Nigeria that have stood up against this tyranny over the years in different ways and in different measure. I acknowledge Zeke of Africa. Zeke told Samadu Bello when the tensions were very high in the early 60s, he said, let us forget our differences. Amadu Bello said something which is very instructive in response. He said, no, let us understand our differences. That's a very weighty statement to make. I'm saying let's forget our differences, like so many people say today. Let's forget our differences. Doesn't matter what has happened to us. Doesn't matter what they did. Doesn't matter. We have no honor, no shame, no nothing. They can kill us, they can rape us, they can do anything. We'll accept it. Let's, let's forget our differences. And he said it at a time that when that was not happening, well before the Civil War. Okay? The man said, no, let us understand our differences. And what he meant by that was this. Look, listen, my worldview is different to yours. My worldview is not what you think. My worldview is that Arewa for the Northerners and the rest for the Northerners. My worldview, and he said it to the BBC, I have it on YouTube right now, he said, we, will not, we would rather employ foreigners into the Northern Civil Service than employ Igbos. Because whenever you put an Igbo anywhere, they want to take everything and keep it for themselves. He said it openly. That is his worldview. And he's telling him, he was telling him, listen, we disagree, we are different. If you're not prepared for me to be the dominant one, the one that is going to rule over you, and take everything for you, from you, and dominate you, and destroy you, and kill you, and do all these other things to you. If you're not going to accept that, then we have no deal. That's the narrative of what he said. And that's what we are facing today. Now, let me, let me say, I said three sons, of the, three sons of the East. The first was Chief Nambi Zukwe, the great Zeke. This uh, Zeke of Africa, who, like I said, tried his best let us put aside our differences. That statement says it all. He tried his best. The next person was the great Tim uh, Chukwemeka uh, Udu, uh, Udu, sorry, Ujuku, who not only spoke, but he acted when he needed to act. And he stood when he needed to stand. In the face of genocide, in the face of mass murder, in the face of ethnic cleansing, he stood for his people. No matter, no matter what happened in the war, the Southeast fought a good fight. And a true soldier will tell another soldier, regardless of which side they fought on, that I honor the fact that you stood for something and that you fought like a man for a principle. And he did that. He's a great son of this part of the country. He's a great son of the <laughs> Finally, I will acknowledge somebody that I will never deny, regardless of whatever situation he's in, regardless of whatever he's going through, regardless of what they subject him, his mother, his father, his household, even his dog to, I will never deny him. My friend and my brother. And his name is Nandi Kanu. And I tell you this, in order for us to have peace in this country, I urge you, I implore you, I beg you in the name of God, leaders of the Southeast, I beg you people of the Southeast, let us try our very best to talk to them at the center to be fair and equitable. If you can achieve that, the rising tide will be stemmed. If you do not achieve that, I speak to you by the power of prophecy today, and I do not wish Nigeria ill. Never. I've benefited too much for three, four generations. My family have benefited from Nigeria. We love Nigeria. But I'll tell you this. If this does not stop, I see a very grim future for this country. I see a situation where people like myself will be swept aside and they'll say, you've been talking for too long. No more talking. No more talking. It's time for those of us that are ready to stand and fight for our rights 
to stand up and fight for our rights. And I fear that day, I pray that day never comes, because war is evil, war is something we should never contemplate. President Koroma can testify to that. We do not want war in this country. To preserve the peace, to preserve the hope, to preserve our future as one nation, let there be changes at the national level. Let Buhari stop this. Let those that are with him stop this and let them recognize the fact that each and every one of us, regardless of where we come from, whether Christian, Muslim, whether Northerner, Southerner, whatever we are, that we are equals before God and that we have a right to exist and we have a right to be. Thank you very much. Oh, oh, oh.